to the name of Jesus. Welcome to church once again. Hallelujah. How many people are glad they're in the house of the Lord through this technology today? We're going to have a great time in the presence of the Lord. Bring your faith, bring your expectations to the table, and let us feast at the feet of Jesus. Hallelujah. Welcome to church. This is Church of Hero Smart, and Hero Smart is a ministry set up by God for the discipleship of the nations. And keep it with the instruction of Jesus in Matthew chapter 28, which says, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I commanded you to do. And Lord, I will be with you till the end of the age. And in trying to keep that instruction in this ministry, God's given us the privilege to create a resource through which we can do that very well. And that resource we've titled the Online Discipleship Program, or the ODP in short. And now the ODP is a set of studies from the Word of God which make a section into five major categories. The pharmacy section of the Word, the milk section of the Word, the meat section of the Word, the water section of the Word, and combination meals. And in coming through the 2020 ODP, God's given us the privilege to come through the pharmacy aspect of it. The milk aspect of it. We are right now in the meat category of the Word of God. We're going to try to further that meat study of the Word of God today with a message that I am going to title The Robe of Righteousness, Part 1. Bless the name of Jesus. We're going to be talking about that today. The Robe of Righteousness, Part 1, is going to be a message in furtherance of the Garments of Righteousness series, which we started a few weeks ago. And the Garment of Righteousness is an extension of the grand series that we did many months ago to talking about the faith of a priest, which the faith of a priest will be certain operations of New Testament believers as we function as priests under Jesus, the high priest, serving in the heavenly tabernacle. And we got that understanding from scriptures like 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, You are a royal priest, a holy nation. In the book, of, the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 1 and verse 6, God's chosen us to be kings and priests, to serve the living God. And all through the Bible, you are going to see how God is calling the believer not just to be a king in Christ Jesus, but to be a priest in Christ Jesus as well. And we, we delve deeper into all that. And we call it the faith of a priest uh, many, many weeks ago. But in coming out of the study of the faith of a priest, we got to understand that there are certain garments that the priests of the Old Testament used to put on themselves as they journeyed toward the most of the place to get one word from God. Um, they had the undergarment, they had the tunic on top of that, and they had the robe on top of that. And on top of the robe, they are going to have the ephod. On top of the ephod, they are going to have uh, the breast piece. And on top of the breast piece, they're going to have the sash. And on top of the sash, they're going to have their torban on. And we know, based on the evidence of Yahushua's um, instruction to the churches in the book of Revelation, that these garments are going to have spiritual implications to them as well. Yahushua was telling the church a lot to see you that you guys are not dressed in the realm of spirit uh, because you, you harbor lukewarmness. A state of treason in your heart, you're lukewarm. I'm getting rid of speech out of my mouth and you're naked in the things of the spirit. Well, Jesus is telling them over there that if you guys were to be fervent and you're not lukewarm, then you are going to have your undergarment. You're not going to be naked in the things of the spirit. Well, guess what? Yahushua is snapping us back into the tabernacle of Moses to make us appreciate that all the garments of the Old Testament, they are going to pass for certain actions of righteousness which God wants us to put on ourselves as priests in the New Testament. And he, he, he went ahead and he talked about the church of Sardis as well. He says, well, because your works are, not, works are not complete right now. You guys have soiled tunics over there. Well, letting us know that there are going to be additional layers of righteousness that God expects us to put in ourselves. So in coming through those studies, we got to realize that there are spiritual implications to these garments that God started talking to the Old Testament priests about. There is going to be a spiritual implication to your undergarment of righteousness. That means zero treason. Don't tolerate treason if there's the good God in your heart. Well, we talked about that many weeks ago. Then on top of that, there's going to be something called the tunic of righteousness, which will be certain wisdom strategies that you got to put on yourself 
to make sure you protect your status of zero treason. When we talked about that several many weeks ago as well. Then on top of the tunic right now, God is saying, I want you to put an additional layer of righteousness on yourself, which we are going to call the robe of righteousness, and we are going to start that study today by the grace of God. So what is the robe? If you can see the little stick man on the board right here, you're going to see that little stick man over there, and he's got his robe really, really adjacent to him. The robe garment is a short-sleeved garment. It's not like the, the tunic. The tunic is long-sleeved, uh, but, but the robe is a short-sleeved garment, and it goes all the way from the neck down to maybe the thigh a little bit over here or something like that, maybe close to the knee or something like that. And then there's a special quality of the robe, which we are going to read in just a little bit, uh, but talking about the, the, the hem of the robe, there are going to be gold bells and pomegranate fruits interspersed in between gold bells. So you're going to see gold bells, pomegranate fruit, fruit. Gold bells, pomegranate fruit. But gold bells, fruit. Gold. What's you're going to see all those all those things over there by the grace of God. So let's turn to the book of Exodus and see where that is documented. It's going to be Exodus chapter twenty-eight and verse thirty-three. Glory to the name of Jesus. Let us see the qualities, the characteristics of the robe garment that God talked about in the Old Testament. Exodus chapter 28 and verse 33. Praise the name of Jesus. Um, I think we're going to go back up to verse 31 right now. It says, Make the robe of the ephod entirely of blue cloth, with an opening for the head in its center. There shall be a woven edge like a collar around this opening so that it will not tear. Make pomegranate of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn around the hem of the robe and with gold bells between them. The gold bells and the pomegranates are to alternate around the hem of the robe and Aaron must wear it when he ministers. The sound of the bells will be heard when he enters the holy place before the Lord and when he comes out so that he will not die. If you've got a paper copy of the Bible, please underline verse 35 over there. What is the reason for the robe? The reason for the robe is so that the robe can make some noise to the people at out of court. So, so, so they're going to, they're going to, when, when Aaron is going into the, to the holy place, that, that, those, those gold bells and those fruit, they're going to be clashing together, making noise to let people know outside, out of court, well, this person is still alive right now. Aaron is still alive. It's going to be clashing together. Plop, plop, plop. What is the spiritual implication of that? Glory to God. The robe is a blue garment that is worn on top of the tunic garment. And it has gold bells interspersed in between pomegranate's fruits to symbolize that an Old Testament priest was still alive to the people in the outer court. It rests on the platform of the tunic and the undergarment, which will be zero treason and wisdom to sustain the status of zero treason. And it provides a basis for the ephod. So on top of the tunic, they're going to put this robe, but then on top of the robe, they are going to put the ephod. So you understand the tunic and the undergarment, that's zero treason, wisdom to sustain the status of zero treason. And then they're going to put that robe on it. So what is the spiritual implication of this robe? The robe garment is going to symbolize your actions of love, through the powers of divine love, the gift of the Holy Spirit, to make a public statement for Jesus in front of unbelievers and with a platform of your tunic and your undergarment. Well, which scripture talks about that? I'm going to ask you, please turn to the book of John in John chapter, chapter 15 to start with. You're going to see that how God expects the believer to bear fruit. Hallelujah. John chapter 15. 
Lord, in the name of Jesus. These things have spiritual implications and God expects the believer to carry the spiritual implications beyond the Old Testament into the New Testament so you can grow your righteousness quotient. We're going to talk about all the reasons for it in just a little bit. John chapter 15, let me read real quickly in verse uh, 13, I believe. Uh, glory to God. Uh, I'm going to back up to verse, verse 12. It says, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, that he should lay his, death, his life down for his friends. And you are my friends if you do what I command you. Now put a, put a bookmark in that scripture we're going to get back to in just a moment. Let's turn to John chapter 13 right now. John chapter 13 and in verse 34. This is the new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Now pause and think a little bit. You're going to ask yourself the question, how many groups of people is Jesus really interested in based on those verses of scripture? John chapter 13, verse 34, and verse 35. You think about it. So Jesus says, love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So you're going to see that God is interested in two categories of people, two groups of people. He's interested in the disciples. And he's interested in the all man category. Why is Jesus interested in making all men to know that the disciples belong to Jesus. Think about that. Because he wants to save them as well. <laughs> he doesn't have a ready access to save the unbelievers because the Spirit of the Lord is not inside unbelievers. But the Spirit of the Lord is going to be looking at the conduct of the believers, the public statements from believers to be able to convict them of their sins and bring them over to the camp of righteousness. There are two objects of love in this passage of scripture in John chapter 13 from verse 34 to verse 35. It says, love one another, talking about the believers, so that all men will know that you are my disciples. So the all men category is important to Jesus. I want them to know. So they can, they can come over to the camp as well and be attracted to the gospel of Jesus. But then there is the believer community as a subset of that. Well, guess what? The all men category, when you make a statement in such a way that will grab the attention of the all men category, the unbeliever community, then that is your robe of righteousness. And when you make a statement in such a way that you are going to walk in love toward the believing community, that is your ephod of righteousness. And we're going to talk about the ephod of righteousness, I believe, uh, next week or maybe two weeks' time or something like that. Another scripture that captures this thought very well, I believe, is Galatians chapter 6. Let's look at Galatians chapter 6. Paul, talking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, identifies two categories of people. In Galatians chapter 6 and in verse 10, it says, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. So you can see there are two categories of people. There is the all man category, and there, there is a subset of that, which is the believer category, believer's category. Bless the name of Jesus. And that's exactly what God was trying to typify by the robe garment back in the Old Testament. Because the robe is going to provide a platform for the ephod. And the ephod is another garment that we are going to be studying, I think next week or maybe two weeks by the grace of God. Which the ephod has the names of the sons of Israel written on his shoulders. It's going to be like an apron. An apron is just like a garment that you wear, especially if you do lots of cooking, you're going to know what an apron is. Uh, and God says, we're going to talk about that later. The names of the sons of Israel are written on the shoulders of the ephod. But the ephod is going to rest on the robe. And that's the reason God's going to say the robe of the ephod. The ephod cannot function without, without its robe. 
The robe has to be a platform, to so create a platform for the ephod. Bless the name of Jesus. So we're going to talk about the ephod later, but what is this robe of righteousness that we're talking about? It is divine love toward humanity, which will provide a platform for divine love for the body of Christ and for the body of the Messiah. Really, really important that we get that understanding. How, how do we know that? Now, let's back up to John chapter 15 right now. You're going to see the real significance of the fruits that God is telling them. I, got, I want you guys to attach fruits to the hem of the garment of the robe. John chapter 15. You're going to see how that's important right now in verse 1. It says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. When every branch in me that does bear fruit, he prunes so that he will even be more fruitful. So God's plan, God's the, the, the Father's plan in particular is so you can bear fruit. So the, make sure you, you bookmark that in your mind. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. He must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, Ask whatever you wish and will be given to you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, therefore showing yourself to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have given you commandment. Now, we can see over here that the fruit that Jesus is talking about over here is love. God expects the believer to bear the fruit of love. Now, when the fruit of love, back in the Old Testament, which is ty typified by the pomegranates, pomegranates fruits slash, start clashing together with, with gold bells, is going to make a lot, lot of noise. And he's going to make noise to the people in the outer court. Now, the people in the outer court are going to be unbelievers, technically, if you bring, bring it over to the New Testament, because every believer is going to be a priest of the New Testament. Um, so, so the people outside the priestly service in the New Testament are going to be technically unbelievers. So guess what? When, when, when the fruit is starting to make a lot of noise to the people in the outer court, he is telling people that we are alive in Christ Jesus. Can you see how that's connected together right now? So the purpose of the robe is to make a lot of noise to the people outside the outer court. As you're doing a service for the Lord, that robe is going to make a lot of noise. It's going to make a lot of noise. Oh, but I'm just going to do my robe of righteousness and I'm going to be quiet about it. No, that's not a robe of righteousness. Actually, if you're quiet about it, and nobody understands or knows that you belong to Jesus. That's not the robe of righteousness. You've got to make a public statement, a lot of noise, to let them know that you are alive in Christ Jesus. Oh, but if I make a lot of noise, that's going to attract persecution. Correct. And we're going to, we're going to talk about that, how to deal with that. But the Word of God says, blessed are you when you are persecuted. There is a blessing associated with persecution which you cannot get in any other way. And that's the reason Jesus is going to be talking to some churches in the book of Revelation. So don't be, don't be afraid of persecution. You get persecuted, I'm going to give you a blessing associated, associated with that. And if you're, if you're not persecuted, you cannot get that blessing that you can get only with being persecuted. So when you make a lot of noise, of course it's going to attract persecution. Of course it's going to grab a hold of the attention of the unbelieving community. Of course something is going to happen over there. But that is your robe of righteousness. And God expects you to put on additional layers of righteousness like that. To make a public statement to the people in the outer court, which are going to be typically unbelievers in the New Testament. Because every believer is going to be a priest serving in the holy place, in the most holy place. 
People in the outer court are believing community. You got to make a lot of noise with the public statement of your testimony of Jesus. But of course, I'm not advocating that you do something foolishly like John the Baptist and start cursing out on Herod. And even, even though Jesus was around that vicinity, he wouldn't curse out on Herod. That's not important. That's why we say you got to leverage the powers of divine love to make that lot of noise. It's still going to be a public statement, but it's going to be done with the wisdom and the gift of the Holy Spirit. We call it podials in this ministry. So what is your robe of righteousness? It is using podials to make a public statement for Jesus with a platform of your tunic and your undergarment. It is doing good to all men, which will provide a platform for doing good to the people in the body of Christ. It is the fruit of the recreated human spirit that shows unbelievers that we are alive in Yahushua. It is called, we call it, advanced operations of divine love. Now, how do we know that? <laughs> how do we know this is going to be advanced operations of divine love? Now, let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 1 right now. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 22. Now, let's see how Peter is admonishing believers to love one another fervently or deeply from the heart. Depending on the kind of translation of the Bible you have, you're going to see the word fervently or deeply from the heart. First Peter chapter 1 and in verse 22. It says, Now that you've purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. If you've got a paper copy of the Bible, please underline that ver verse of scripture like that. Love one another deeply from the heart. So Peter acknowledges the fact that you guys have elementary love operations. And a lot of you coming through the middle color word, you're going to remember what that is. We call that divine love in his ministry. So you understand what it means to love like God loves. Not necessarily like the TV preachers who want to teach you how to love. <laughs> the way God loves is... It's kind of misconstrued in this generation. They start telling you, well, you want to love the way God loves, you're going to be sentimental and all that kind of stuff. No, no, no. But the divine love that we're talking about is behaving like God in all situations, which is going to be equivalent to simultaneous displays of kindness and justice for the purpose of righteousness. The Word of God says in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23 and 24, if anybody wants to boast that they understand or know me, let them boast that they know that this is the way I behave in kindness and justice for the purpose of righteousness all over the earth. The way God behaves, in which 1 John chapter 4 says God is love, is going to be equivalent to a simultaneous display of kindness and justice for the purpose of righteousness in all the earth. You have that fundamental understanding and you love your brothers and the people in your world with that understanding. I want to have kindness and justice to promote righteousness. The condition of a right standard relationship with God to foster right doing in God's creation. That's the way I think that is fundamental love to our humanity and to our believers. You understand that from the middle of the Word of God. We talked about faith to Word of God for divine love. And I'm going to leverage the powers of divine love to do those kind of actions in my life. Because I, I'm not that smart. I don't know what action of mine is going to have kindness and justice. And at the same time, will promote righteousness in the earth. I, I'm not that smart. I don't know how to do that. Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 tells us the way of love. Uh, uh, but that the gift of the Holy Spirit will be the way to help you do that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and chapter 14 and back up to chapter 12. We did that study in the milk of the word. That is fundamental love. Fundamental divine love. You have that. But Peter now goes further that I want you to start loving deeply from the heart. So how do I love deeply from the heart after understanding fundamentally that a God kind of love, the God kind of behavior in my life is going to be KJR. How do I do that? Well, the book of John, in John chapter 15, that we just read over there, it says, No greater love 
Can a man display other than to lay down his life for his friends? Let's look at it again. John chapter 15 and verse 13. It says, Greater love has no man than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. So if Peter is expecting us to get into some kind of deeper love, he says, well, you got to love each other fervently or deeply for the heart right now. Yahushua gives us an explanation of what some kind of deep love is going to be. John 15, 13, online. What Jesus said, well, there is no deeper love, no greater love than to lay down your life for your friends. So Jesus is saying over there, if you really want to fulfill 1 Peter chapter 1, and verse 22, to love deeply from the heart, then the way you're going to do it is to give your life for your brothers, give your life for your sisters, give your life to humanity. Oh, wow. I give my life, so I'm going to go hang on the cross? Hold on, I'm not telling you to do that. Well, how do I give my life right now? Jesus is telling me, give, give your life. <laughs> if you want to love deeply from the heart, holds oh, the way Jesus gave his life is to go hang on the cross for, for humanity. Do I need to go ahead and not, not exactly? And I'm going to tell you that when God, when Jesus says no greater love can a man have than to give his life, for, for, for his friends, you're going to understand that Jesus is not necessarily talking about hanging on the cross, even though he had to do that as a sacrifice for humanity. But if he's encouraging believers to do that for themselves, it's not necessarily telling believers to go hang on the cross just for your brothers and sisters. How did Yahushua give his life? We're talking about the deep love right now. Now, there's a scripture in the book of Isaiah that's, that is going to answer that question for us. In Isaiah chapter 53, glory to God, Isaiah 53 is going to answer that question for us. It's a Messianic scripture talking about the ministry of Jesus even in the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 53, mm. I'm going to start to read from verse 11. It says, after the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death, start on the line, and was numbered with the transgressors, for he bore the sins of many and made intercession for transgressors. Underline that. So this is talking prophetically about Jesus right from the Old Testament, the book of Isaiah. It says the way, the way Jesus is going to give his life is he's going to pour his life through intercession for many. Can you see over there? So when Yahushua starts saying in John chapter 15 and verse 13, that, I, that there is no greater love that a man should give his life for his friends. The spirit behind that, really, if you want to, want, to, want to dig deeper into it, is the pouring of your life out as a sacrifice through the intercession. Yahushua, dying on the cross, would have not been efficacious if the substance of his heart and his life was not made available to humanity, which is Zoe. Jesus went through the physical emotions of dying on a cross, and humanity didn't have everlasting righteousness, which is going to guarantee a continuous flow of Zoe to our spirits going forward. Yahushua's crucifixion across the Calvary will have been worthless. And that's the reason Paul will say in 1 Corinthians 13 that I can give my body to be burned and still not have the God kind of love in me. So the physical sacrifices, the physical sufferings of me dying on the cross and Jesus dying on the cross wouldn't really matter if the substance of his heart is not poured out as a ransom for many. Guess what? That's the spirit behind giving your life. Now if you take that spirit and you apply that understanding to the way you operate in your robe of righteousness, you're going to understand the way I am going to love deeply from the heart. To give my life as a ransom for many is to pour the substance of my heart out to, to, to humanity. And that is going to embellish every action of divine love and gesture that I give to humanity. Did you get it? 
<laughs> I believe you did. This is the mean of the word. You got to start connecting all these dots right now. What, what are you talking about? The substance of your heart. Well, I know you come through the milk of the word. You know the substance of your heart. The substance of your heart is when you push it out through the intercession, it's going to come out as innocence. So how do you do that in practical terms? We're talking about when you pray the kingdom through every day, what you are going to do is you're going to create a flux field of incense all around your world. What is your world? Your world is going to be a physical vicinity, a spiritual vicinity. Your physical vicinity is going to be defined by potentially whatever you want to call it. But I call it about 10,000 miles away from me because the word of God says 10,000 is going to fall to your right, 1,000 to your, to your left, and nothing is going to, no harm. So I just put 10,000 miles away from me. That's your physical vicinity. And your spiritual vicinity is going to be the lives of the people in your family and all the people all the world that God has chosen to put under your cover and in his own sovereignty. As you grow in your spiritual capacity as a recreated human spirit, functioning right now as a priest of the New Testament, you pray the kingdom through. You use grandfather scriptures like, My people shall be established in righteousness, and free and far from all oppression of the devil. You are going to create a flux field of incense all around your world when you pray every morning. Truth. Real stuff. That flux field of your of righteousness, that flux field of incense, which is a derivative of Zoe water, which comes out as you intercede, you push out with travail, you generate spiritual energy out of the bellies of those who believe shall flow from rivers of living water, is literally your life. Yes. It is your spiritual life, it is your physical life, it is everything you got, it is your resource, and it is pouring out your life. Why will the Holy Spirit allow Isaiah to use the word pour your life over here? Pour. Let us know it's going to be something that you're going to pour, like a fluid, like a liquid. You pour it out. Well, that's letting us know, though, that it's a spiritual substance that governs your life, that you are pouring out and dispersing to humanity every day. And when you do that, subsequent particles. Like through the word of wisdom, word of knowledge, discerns the spirits that you are going to be issuing the people will be backed up by this incense to make a public statement for Jesus. So when you say a word to somebody, they are going to be cut to heart and they're going to be pushed in the direction of righteousness because the substance of your heart is backing up those words. Because we know that the kingdom of God is not just a matter of talking. The word of God says the kingdom of God is a demonstration of spirit and power. When you speak words and the spiritual energy is backing up your words, the kingdom of the Lord is going to be enforced in the lives of the hearers of your words. When you do that, that's your robe of righteousness. You speak words and spiritual energy is not backing up your word. It's not a robe of righteousness, even though you spoke words. Or the degree to which spiritual energy backs up the words that you speak to people is the degree to which you've loved them deeply from the heart. So the baby Christian who's just operating, starting to operate in potholes right now, uh, there's going to be a little trickle of spiritual energy that's going to back up his word or her words, whatever the words they say. Well, that's going to be a rumor of righteousness as well. If that word is directed to an unbeliever, is going to grab, grab a hold of their attention a little bit. The Holy Spirit can use that to start moving them in the direction of righteousness. But as you mature in the things of the Spirit, and you start developing and start growing in stature and wisdom and capacity, the volume of incense that your spirit can push out when you pray every day is going to be greater. And when you say a word, and someone hears that word, <laughs> the impact of that word on their spirit is going to be a lot greater that the impact of a word you might have spoken to them years ago when you were a baby Christian. Real stuff. The kingdom of God is not just a matter of talking. It is a demonstration of spirit and power. Spiritual power as the back of every word that you say. And that comes when you pour your life out through the intercession. Which scripture says that? Isaiah chapter 53. I will give them a portion among the great. And he will divide the spoils with the strong because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with transgressors for he bore the sins of many and made intercession for transgressors. 
This is advanced operation of divine love over here and will pass for your robot righteousness when you use potions to make public statement with this platform. I believe you got it. It's the meaning of the word. You got to start connecting all these dots by the grace of God in the name of Jesus. Let's look at another scripture in Isaiah chapter 61 and verse 10. Hallelujah. Isaiah chapter 61 and verse 10. It says, I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God. For he has clothed me with garments of salvation. And arrayed me in a robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom adores his head like a priest. And as a bride adores herself with her jewels. So operating like a priest is going to be equivalent to being arrayed in a robe of righteousness. Now lots of you understand what does it mean to operate like a priest. Can I hear Tabitha of Moses right there. When you start functioning like a priest... And of course, you're going to be arrayed with a robe of righteousness. Well, the priest is the person who's taken up their place to pray after the tabernacle of Moses to generate spiritual energy that will back up their kingship ministry. Guess what? The word of God says you are going to be arrayed with a robe of righteousness, just like that. So you can bookmark that scripture to solidify that understanding. When you start functioning like a priest, and you start operating in words of wisdom, word of knowledge, discernment of spirits, gift of faith, and all these things. To our unbelievers, making a public statement to them, your words are going to be backed up with the spiritual energy that you pour out every morning as you pour out your life in intercession. Praise the name of Jesus. Job chapter 29, Job had that understanding as well. Uh, even though I believe that the Job's tunic was kind of soiled somewhere. So he was trying to pull out his robe of righteousness. And he was uh, using that in his defense. Uh, why, why is uh, all these things happening to me, Lord? Why all these things happening to me? I got my robe of righteousness and trying to do my best possible to help humanity. But Satan was, was still hitting him because he, his, his robe of righteousness didn't have a, a background of the tunic of righteousness and his honor of righteousness in certain instances. Let's look at Job chapter 29 and in verse 8. It says, the young man saw me and stepped aside. And the old man rose to their feet. The chief man refrained from speaking and covered their mouths with their hands. Their voices, the voices of the nobles were hushed. And their tongues stuck to the roof of their mouths. Whoever heard, must, heard me spoke well of me. And those who saw me commanded me. Because I rescued the poor. Starts to listen his Actions of robe of righteousness right now. Who cried, cried for help. And the fatherless will, will have none to assist him. The man who was dying blessed me. Blessed me. I made the widow's heart sink. I put on righteousness as my clothing. And justice, justice was my robe and my torment. So Job, Job understands that when you start doing certain things, especially for humanity, that's going to pass as your robe of righteousness. Why, God, are you still afflicting me? I think you're going to be interested in me trying to bless people and bless people. And come on, what's, what's the matter with, you know, things still, still getting broken around me. God, what's the matter? So he was using this as his defense, which based on his understanding, if you do good for humanity, then everything's going to be okay with you because you're clothing the poor, you're doing this for the homeless, you're helping the fatherless. Well, looking deeply into it, you're going to understand his robe, he was kind of putting on without his tunic on or something like that. But we have our tunic on right now. We have our, we have our tunics. We have our undergarments. So we reserve the right to start putting our robes on. Well, guess what, what's, what's going to be that robe? This public statement's over here. This actions of love, which are going to have a backing of the, of the life of God that you are going to pour out to your need. So you reserve your right to do what Job is doing over here and expecting the devil not to hit you like he hit Job because you have your tunic and your undergarment on. Bless the name of Jesus. The mean all word. I believe you're connecting all the dots in the name of Jesus. So the, the robe of righteousness will be a O-D toward humanity. A 
advanced operations of divine love. I think last year we called it AOA, which is advanced operation of, of agape. But I'm steering away from the term agape because that term has been bastardized in the 21st century church. When, when people hear the word agape in the back of their minds, they're going to stop talking about unconditional love. And that's, that's not the way God behaves at all. Behaves at all. Because even though he is patient and long-suffering with you, he is going to act toward you conditionally because he loves you. If you obey my commandments, certain blessings will come to you. You disobey my commandments, certain curses will come in your circumstances, and blessings plus curses, all equivalent to the love that God shows toward you. And just like you discipline your children when they don't, they're not acting right, you don't discipline them just because you hate them. You discipline them just to make sure that they turn out right because you love them. But the answer in the 21st century church is going to assume that God is going to unconditionally bless you because he is agape and unconditional love. That's not the way my God behaves. Now, I can't read that from the pages of the Bible. I don't know what kind of Bible you got. So I'm steering away from that word agape right now. I'm just going to call it divine love. So that's the reason we are going to call this one AOD, Advanced Operations of Divine Love. That is your robe of righteousness when it is channeled toward humanity, the unbelieving community, when you make a public statement for the Lord. And just like we said, there are two objects of AOD in John chapter 13 and verse 34 to 35. The first object, the first group of people, will be the world on the unbeliever community, and that is your robe of righteousness. The second one is going to be to the disciples or the believing community, and that's going to be your E for the righteousness, which we are going to talk about later. AOD toward the first objects provides a platform for AOD toward the second object. AOD toward the first object, the world, is our robe of righteousness. And as you pray the kingdom through every day, unbelievers within your sphere of influence will start coming closer to the kingdom of God. And God will then give you parties to minister to them during your waking hours. Let's look at Matthew chapter um, chapter 5 in verse 16 real quickly. We know that's going to precipitate this some kind of action. When an unbeliever comes in your presence, they should make it they should they shouldn't feel comfortable to sing around you. I mean, we have the story of people like Smith Wigglesworth back in the 1800s. He's going to come around and he's going to enter a train and try to go from point A to point Z or something like that. And everybody's just going to come down and start repenting of their sins without even saying a word. Why? He carries an atmosphere. There's, there's an aura of the presence of, of the Lord right all over him. He carries that atmosphere. It's not possible for him to see him over there. <laughs> Bless the name of the Why did they do that? Well, because it's pouring out his life as a ransom for me. And right now, there is an atmosphere. There, 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 is a, there is an aura. There is an aura of righteousness all around him. Bless the name of Jesus. And we had uh, so some kind of testimonies like that. <laughs> Remember growing up in college, and we, we, we were living in dormitories. We, we had uh, several roommates and all over there. And all the unbelievers, they're going to come in the room, they're going to come and start doing all kinds of madness over there. Remember, <laughs> remember what one, one case in my final year, one unbelieving boy that came over there, and he just, you know, was trying to do all kind of madness in the room. He said, well, you can't do this over here. He just, he wasn't comfortable. He had to leave the room. He just, he got out of the dormitories. He said, you know, you can't do this madness over here. No, there's an aura of glory all over there. When you, when you pray the kingdom through unbelievers, the Holy Spirit is going to be convicting them of their sins. God needs that. And Paul was talking to the church, incurring that God needs your conduct to convict the unbelievers of their sins because the Holy Spirit is not in them. How will they do that? Through your public statements, which have a backing of your life. A backing of the incense that you generate and create a flux filled of incense all around you, making it difficult for sin, chaos, and confusion to rule where you are. What's going to be ruling where you are? Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Matthew chapter 5 in verse 16. 
Glory to God. In the same way you are the light, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Can you see that? There is a purpose for your light. The reason God's placed the light of life on you and in you is so that all men may see. Well, that's your robe of righteousness over there. Let's back up to verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by man. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before man that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. That's your robe of righteousness. Let your light shine and cover it up. Oh, well, if I let, let my light shine, they're going to persecute me. Well, God says there's a blessing associated with persecution over there. Blessed are you when you're persecuted. In verse 10 of Matthew chapter 5, because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. There is a blessing associated with persecution. Don't run away from it. Oh, if they persecute me, that doesn't mean they're going to kill me prematurely, not necessarily. We talked about sweep, we talked about different kinds of strategies, which we are going to be talking about next week. I believe even uh, uh, talking about saying no to social stereotypes. You're going to understand how to overcome persecutions. They persecuted Jesus, but they didn't kill Jesus prematurely. Oh, but Jesus got, got crucified. No, 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 no. Jesus gave his life to be crucified. They tried numerous times to crucify Jesus on this side of eternity before his time, and they couldn't. They could only persecute him and crucify him when he laid down his life. They came into the garden grove to try to arrest Jesus. And Yahushua said, what are you looking for? They all fell backward. If Yahushua didn't want to give his life, there is no way they could have crucified him. <laughs> so persecutions and persecutors will not necessarily overcome you if you learn the strategy of Jesus, which we are going to be getting into in the series. But do not run away from persecutions. The persecution of the 21st century, especially in this part of the world, we're privileged. <laughs> Doesn't even get as egregious as somebody trying to, try to nail you to the cross. I know in other parts of the world it gets real bad and they can literally cut your head off or something like that. But we're blessed with that, <laughs> with a certain sanctity on this side of, side of the world right now that it doesn't even get that bad. He's going to get some people talking nasty about you and they're, they're going to ostracize you and they're going to, they're going to do all the kind of, And you're scared of that? <laughs> Better let Jesus hear that. Yahushua is going to say, well, if you denounce me in the presence of the ungodly all around this planet, I'm going to den denounce you in the presence of my father and the angels. You don't want, you want, you don't want that to be your story at all. No, 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 no. I'm not going to be scared just because you're talking nasty or ostracizing me. Well, that's your business. At the end of the day, you're going down, I'm going on. Bless the name of Jesus. Persecutors will fail except they change their ways. They're not going to win against you. Do not be afraid. Put your robe of righteousness on. The Holy Spirit needs that. It's a testament to convict them of their sins. Do not be afraid. Luke chapter 12 and in verse 8. Glory, glory, glory to Jesus. We're talking about growing, growing your righteousness quotient in here so that before you call, God, God can answer for you. We, we know that based on the incense equations, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man is going to make a significant amount of personal dynamics, of personal incense available. This generation in lots and lots of places all around the world is doing a lot of praying and there's very little answers. And why is that? Because righteousness quotient is low. So we got to be interested in growing our righteousness quotient in this, in, uh, in, this, in this generation. And one way to grow your righteousness quotient is to put your robe on top of your tunic by the grace of God. Luke chapter 12 and in verse 8. I tell you, whoever acknowledges me before man, the Son of Man will also acknowledge him before the angels of God. But whoever disowns me before man will be dis 
found before the angels of God. Can you see that? So you're going to be at that lunch party right now and you're together with some unbelievers and everybody's just drinking alcohol. And they, they're watching you. They know you're a Christian. You're going to say, well, I'm just going to, I'm just going to take, a, take this water over here. And then they're going to start a conversation with you. Oh, why aren't you drinking alcohol? Oh, wow. A great opportunity for that bell to clash together with that fruit of pomegranates. Right? And say, well, because I'm a Christian. I'm serious about my destiny. Well, we're Christians, too. You think alcohol is going to send you to hell? Of course, it's going to send you to hell if you keep, keep indulging in it. And preach a sermon and knock them with the party of the Spirit over there. But you're just keeping quiet and say, well, I don't want people to know that. Well, Jesus is going to say, I will slap your face over there. Don't do that. The oh, Lord of God. Let them know that, that wine and alcohol is not for kings. The book of Proverbs says, give wine to those who are perishing or something like that. No, you don't do that. Oh, well, Jesus turned water into wine. Well, Jesus turned water into non-alcoholic wine. The wine that Jesus turned over in the kingdom of Galilee and created by, by the work of the miracle is not going to intoxicate people and, and get people to lose their brains when they drink too much of it. No, no, no. It is not alcoholic wine. You serve non-alcoholic wine at that lunch party, I'm going to drink some of it. But you serve alcohol, count me out. I'm not drink, drinking that. And let your palm the testimony get out of you. And let the Holy Spirit grab, grab a hold of your word a little bit and just start convicting unbeliever A, B, C, Wow, that's your robe of righteousness. Excellent opportunity. Don't pass it up. <laughs> Glory to God. Philippians chapter 1 and in verse 27. Let's take a look at that scripture real quickly. I believe you guys are getting a better context of what your robe of righteousness is going forward. And as the Holy Spirit gives you opportunities, you're going to let this word of wisdom, word of knowledge come out of you to make a public statement to the unbelieving community. That Jesus is alive in me and I am alive. I'm not a dead priest. I am alive in Yahushua. Make a statement for Jesus. Glory to God. Philippians chapter 1. Verse 27. This is Paul talking about the robe of righteousness here again. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Can you see that? So there is a manner that is worthy of the gospel of Jesus. There is a manner that is not going to be worthy of the gospel of Jesus. Which manner is, is going to be worthy of the gospel of Jesus? When you choose to be the lights in your community. When you choose to be the salt of the world. Which, which, which manner is not going to be worthy of the gospel of Jesus? When you refuse to shine your lights and you cover it up. Because you're afraid of persecution and persecutors. Then whether I come and see you or wholly hear about you in my absence, I know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For God, for it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but to suffer persecutions for him. Since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now here that I still have. Do not be afraid of persecution and persecutors. Just because you're putting on the robe of righteousness, God needs your testimony to save people, to get a harvest of righteousness. The Holy Spirit can't do that randomly because it's not in unbelievers. They're not going to listen to a small, still voice, so they need some external conduct to grab their attention. Glory to God. Why the robe of righteousness? The robe of righteousness is designed to provide a platform for advanced operations of divine love toward the body of Christ. We can see that. You need a platform for your ephod, but there is not going to be any platform for your ephod if you don't know how to love humanity, firstly, with the powers of divine love. I think that's a no-brainer. You know that already. And other reasons, so that Yeshua will not deny us in the presence of the Father and of the angels, just like we read in Luke chapter 12 in verse 8. You don't want Yahushua to say, well, I never knew you. Oh, Lord, what are you talking about? I've been born in you for about 25 years, 30 years. I did all this. Well, say, well you denied me at our launch party or something like that. Oh, well, why won't that be my testimony? And that's not your testimony by the grace of God. 
The Holy Spirit needs your testimony and public statements for Yahushua to convict the world of their sins since he is not in them. The Word of God says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 23 to 25, talking to the church in Corinth, when an unbeliever comes in your presence and they see you acting in a manner that is worthy of the gospel of Jesus, the secrets of their hearts are going to be made known and they are going to repent of their ways and give their lives over to Jesus. John chapter 16 and verse 8 talks about the ministry of the Holy Spirit is going to convict the world of their sins. But how will it do that? Through your condoms. How will it do that? Through your robe of righteousness. How will it do that? Through the public statements that you put on yourself as you grow your righteousness quotient for speedy answers to prayers. Another reason is going to be your robe of righteousness is the evidence of bearing fruit as a healthy branch of the vine. You don't put your robe of righteousness on. Every opportunity that you have to show that you belong to Jesus, to show that you're the salt of the earth, to show that you're the light, and the city that is supposed to be on a hill, you pass up that opportunity. You cover up your light. You're not bearing fruit for the Father. Why? Because the Father wants a fruit of righteousness on the earth. And think about it. Let's do a technical analysis right now. So there is this unbeliever who's thinking of uh, committing an immorality or something like that. And he just came around and you gave a word that convicted him of their sins. Boom! Oh, he felt bad about that. He says, well, I'm not going to do that anymore. Can that happen? Yes, it can happen. When they see something on the outside, the Holy Spirit can grab a hold of that. Boom! It's going to push them. Now, because they don't do that immorality, guess what? They're not going to cause more chaos on the planet because of that. And then there's going to be Zoe that God could have used to stamp out the fires and the chaos that could have caused God can use that Zoe to do something else over there. So guess what? You promoted righteousness. You further the Father's interest on the planet just simply by you putting on your robe of righteousness. But what about if I don't do that? And he just goes ahead and he wallows in his immorality. He does all this kind of madness over there. And he causes a bunch of chaos. Well, there's going to be a, a, a baby out of wedlock or something like that. Oh, wow. The father's going to have to do all this kind of things. And we'll oh, God. You cause more problems in God's creation. No righteousness. No fruit of righteousness on the earth. Really serious stuff. Learn how to put your robe of righteousness on top of your tunic and your undergarment. Another reason is to rebuild ancient ruins, to restore forgotten godly traditions that will lead to supernatural actions of God on the earth. So when you start acting in powers of divine love, and you're trusting the Holy Spirit when you're around unbelievers, oh, Holy Spirit, please come help me. What do I need to say over here? Holy Spirit, help me over there. You may, you may not even speak a word sometimes. It may just be a gesture. People just look at you like this. Wow, they feel a reverence over there. Say, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm not saying anything to you. Just say, Why are you saying all this yes, sir stuff to me? <laughs> well, there's, 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 there's an oral presence over here. When you do that, by the grace of God, people are going to start witnessing the powers of the Holy Spirit in their lives. They're going to start witnessing word of wisdom what, that, that's going to create a crescendo into... Making them realize that the God of the nations is not dead. We're going to start seeing miracles on the heels of your operation just because you put your robe of righteousness on in the name of Jesus. And uh, this ministry is, is a little bit uh, not open to the public just yet. We're, we're, we're trusting God that God's going to, going to enlarge our territory. But we're building disciples just yet to do that. When we get an opportunity to, to be open to the public, you're going to see that all these things I'm talking about uh, are going to be really needed on a large scale. Uh, it's an online church to start with, and you cannot connect with us except we call you. <laughs> and uh, we give an invitation for you. We're going to give an, uh, another invitation next year. If you want to be a part of the ministry, starting from December 1st up until December 21st, you want to join the ODP for 2021, you're going to have to ask for us to, to come over. <laughs> so it's not open to, to the public just yet. Now I'm doing that on purpose because what Jesus actually recommends is to make disciples of all nations, not just to make a bunch of people that are going to come in and come out and you know flow, flow into the church anytime they like what the preacher is talking about 
Or they want to have a boogie dance over there. They come in and spend five minutes to do boogie dance and they get out again. No, no, no. That's not the model that Matthew 28 preaches. He preaches discipleship. And discipleship is going gonna, is gonna to require commitment and accountability. You're not going to be coming in and going out and floating around and doing all kinds of stuff. That's the reason I structured it this way by the grace of God. But that doesn't mean that we cannot have many disciples, disciples, even with this model. It's going to happen by the grace of God. Glory to God. Another reason is to obtain the heathen as our inheritance, your badge of honor in the realm of the spirit when you start putting on your robe of righteousness to pull people closer to the way of righteousness. Another reason is for the conversion of the wealth of the nations to us because of our priestly operations. When you start operating like this and God starts using you to convict unbeliever A, B, C of their sins and bring them over to righteousness, that he's going to be the wealth of nations converting over to you like that by the grace of God. And we are growing in it even as we speak. Another reason is going to be uh, your robe of righteousness is another layer of righteousness that will grow your righteousness quotient. A lot of you know what righteousness quotient is, is, is in this ministry. It is the virtue, the anointing upon you for speedy answers to your prayers so that praise can spring forth from the earth to God. And Zoe's going to recycle back to God to conserve spiritual energy, just like I have explained a few moments ago. The road of righteousness gives you an opportunity to shine and give illumination to the darkness of the world. You are the light of the world. You are the salt of the world. Putting on your robe of righteousness will precipitate persecution that will lead to greater glories, but not to kill you. Because the word of God says in Revelation chapter 12 that the man-child company is going to be snatched up out of here alive. Bless the name of Jesus. And the, 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 the man-child company displayed splendor, was clothed with the sun, and he had the moon under their feet. <laughs> so Mr. Devil didn't get that, even though they had a godly testimony that potentially was challenged by persecutors. But they didn't get that. So the question is, how do you do it so the devil doesn't get you? you got to reenact your commitment to walk in AOD, Advanced Operations of Divine Love Toward Humanity, with the basis of zero treason, which is your undergarment, and wisdom strategies to sustain the status of zero, tre tre zero treason, which is going to be your tunic. The Word of God says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, I believe that you will be able to punish the devil if your obedience is complete. That's why we beat so hard on perfect obedience and zero treason. That is where you start from. That is your undergarment. We talked about that last week, two weeks, and three weeks, and several weeks ago. Make sure you don't lose that. But on top of that, right now, you have the rights, the authority, and the backing of heaven right now to start challenging the God of this world who may be blindfolding the mind of unbelievers. Through powers of divine love, God's going to give you that word. He's going to give you that, that gesture over there. God's going to tell you to put something on YouTube. God's going to tell you to do those things in the public statement. You reserve a right to do that because you have your undergarment on by the grace of God. Exercise complete faith principles to, to stretch the frontiers of the kingdom of God in your world every day. Using grandfather scriptures and grandfather parables and grandfather promises like Isaiah chapter 54 verse 14, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. Lots of you know that already. My people shall be established in righteousness and shall be free and far from all the pressures of the devil. And that subsequently leverage paw deals for dilemmas when relating with unbelievers. Look for opportunities to make public statements for Yahushua. Do not cover up your light under a bushel. You are the salt and the light of the world. But get the job done through sweep without losing your life foolishly. Like Paul, who lost his life prematurely. And we're going to do a case study next week of how Paul lost his life foolishly by going back to Jerusalem after God literally plucked him out of there and gave him a home with the Gentile churches that he founded. And out of sediments, he went back into Jerusalem and he got killed because of that. And his early exit 
led him to Jesus giving the book of Revelation to John the Beloved to start correcting certain excesses of the churches that were directly founded or indirectly founded by the ministry of Paul. The church of Ephesus was founded by Paul. The church of Smyrna, I believe, was founded directly or indirectly through Paul's ministry because all these all this churches were where Paul was sent to minister to. And he did an excellent job when he was here and it was documented to the church in Philippi that it is actually to my benefit that I stay around. Let's look at that. Philippians chapter 1. You're going to see Paul talking about, i got to stay around for your faith right now. Uh, Philippians chapter 1 and in verse 19. It says, Yet, yes, I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For me to die, for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am going on living in this body, this will make fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress joy in the faith so that through my being with you again your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. He says, well, if I want to depart and be with Jesus right now, that's going to be absolutely um, ecstatic for me. Really, really great and wonderful. But I've got to be around for your faith. I've got to be around to make sure you guys make progress in the things of the Spirit. So I'm going to be around. Now contrast that statement with Acts chapter 21 right now. How Paul was being pulled out of sentiments, sentiment to leave his calling to the Gentiles and go back to Jerusalem to go preach to a bunch of hard nosed people who don't want to listen to the gospel of Jesus. Why did you do that, Paul? Sentiments. Now let's look at it. Acts chapter 21 and in verse 4. Finding the disciples there, we stayed with them seven days, and through the Spirit they urged Paul not to go on to Jerusalem, through the Spirit. But when our time was up, we left and continued on our way. All the disciples and their wives and their children accompanied us out of the city, and there on the beach we knelt to pray. After saying goodbye to each other, we went aboard the sheep, and they returned home. We continued our voyage in Tyre and landed in Tolinus, where we greeted the brothers and stayed with them for a day. Leaving the next day, we reached Caesarea and stayed in the house of the house of Philip, the evangelist, one of the seven over there. He had four or married daughters who prophesied. And after we had been there a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Coming over to us, he took Paul's belt, tied it, tied his own hands and feet with it, and said, The Holy Spirit says, In this way, the Jews of Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the people there pleaded with Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, Why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. When he will not be dissuaded, we give up and say the Lord's will be done. Why? So you contrast Paul's foolish resolve to go and die in Jerusalem with what he talked to the church in Philippi about. You're going to see that this doesn't make sense. So you said in Philip, in Philippians chapter 1, that it is necessary for you to be around so you can ensure the churches make progress, but all of a sudden you're going to, you're going to dump all that progress and you want to go die foolishly in Jerusalem. It doesn't make sense. But unfortunately, that's what happened and that's what sentiment is going to do to people. 
Oh, they're my people in Jerusalem. The gospel was sent. Jesus came to die for them. I come there now again. I'm going to go ahead and try again. No, you don't need to do that. Yahushua said, I'm taking you over to spread my gospel to the Gentiles. And he said, I've got sheep that are not part of this fold. Yahushua cares about the Gentile community becoming, becoming believers just as, as much as he cared for the people in, in the nation of Israel becoming believers. They don't want to listen. Go somewhere else. God's going to get them later. Do not be sentimental. Some of the strategies that you are going to learn to overcome persecutions, if you are the minority in a certain situation, you're saying, well, these people are not listening to me over there. Listen to the Holy Spirit and exit. But if you are not the minority, if you are the majority in certain situations, use SFIP, and we're going to learn that all through next week, and I think we talked about that before. So don't you take this message and start doing something crazy right now. So, well, I've got my Ruby Rochester, I'm just going to go jam it down there for it. Remember Paul. Paul's early exit from this planet created a situation that we call right now Latitude 1040 window situation. Which Latitude 1040 window will be areas of the world right from North Africa down into the Middle East where the gospel of the Lord has, be, has, has, not, been, has not been able to penetrate for over 2,000 years significantly. And those were the places that Paul had his ministry, the Asia Minor, down into the Middle East, all these places, Turkey and all this. Paul had his foot all right over there. You should have built those churches that those churches will have their lampstand not extinguished for the next 2,000 years. There should have been the church of Ephesus up until 2020. The church of Smyrna, the church of Pergamum, all those churches, the church of Tyre, they should have been around. We lost all that. Because somebody was walking in sentimental love. <laughs> but that's a lesson to us in the 21st century. And you got to do a little bit better than Paul. Now Paul, I understand, he didn't have <laughs> the Bible and the complete canon of scriptures to make a, an educated decision. And when God sees that your heart is really not inclined in the direction of the whole counsel of God, God's not going to give you commands anymore. Because he doesn't want to slide into treason and then he's going to toss you away. So the father backed up from talking to Paul directly and giving express commands so he doesn't get into treason and all this kind of stuff. And God worked with him in his, uh, what I call, permissive will of God. If you really want to go die, well, that's fine. <laughs> there's, there's some stupid saints that are going to die prematurely. But that's not God's best plan for you. Some of you have been born again for the past 20 years, 25 years. You've garnered a lot of experience, and we're not going to get that experience by just trying to get somebody born again overnight. Now, if you're wiser than somebody who got born again yesterday, we need that wisdom. We've got to preserve you. We're not going to lose you foolishly, even though you're trying to put on your robe of righteousness. Is it important for you to put your robe of righteousness on? Correct. Is it important? You've got to do it with the powers of divine love, with the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, so that even though you're persecuted, persecutors do not win. You win and they lose. How do you do that? Come back next week. I'm going to teach you in detail by the grace of God. Glory to God. So get the job done with Paul, the wisdom of the gifts and the manifestation of the Holy Spirit, without you losing your life foolishly or dying prematurely. And you shine on because you win. With the powers of divine love as you put your room of righteousness on in the name of Jesus. Glory to God. Bless the name of Jesus. Did you get something out of it? This is where I would like to stop today. We talked about uh, the room of righteousness part one. What is your role? There are going to be actions of divine love, advanced operations of the God kind of love toward the unbelieving community. As you make a statement uh, for Jesus. You want to show the unbelieving community that you are alive in Yahushua. And you do that with the powers of divine love, with the backhand of the substance of your heart that you pour out through intercession. As you make intercession for transgressors in your world every morning, when you pray the kingdom through to cover every sphere of your influence by the grace of God. Why do we need to do that? The tunnel raises is going to keep the Father of Hobbies the righteousness when the Holy Spirit starts to grab a hold of your conducts to start working in their hearts to change their ways of error. It's going to grow your righteousness quotient so you can have speedy answers to prayers and numerous other reasons. How do we do that? Reenact your decision to operate like this. 
exercise complete faith principles for the kingdom of God every day to stretch the frontiers of incense all around you. Create a flock's field of the life of God. And then you step into your world when you are in the presence of unbelievers. Listen to the Holy Spirit and give a word that is seasoned with salt to bring grace to your hearers by the grace of God. And do it in style without losing your life foolishly like Paul in the name of Jesus. All right, as my custom is, I'm going to give you, give the vegan audience an opportunity to take a snapshot of the study notes on the board so they can start a study along with us. And I'll be back after 10 seconds. Oh, glory to Jesus. I believe you got a chance to take a copy of the study notes on the board so you can start the study along with us. This is where I'm going to like to stop today. This is Robo Righteousness, part one. Please, 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 and please come back for part two. It's really important. This message is a two-part message. Don't just take one part and run off with it. We don't want to do that. Please come back for part two. 2020 online discipleship program. Thank you for staying on board. I say be blessed. In the name of Yahushua. Amen. Mm -hmm.